Guys, we did it! We did it! We've reached the end of the year, and also the end of the decade, and now we are into the Roaring Twenties. I don't know about you guys, but this year's been kind of crazy. I mean, it's been crazy politically, socially, by really any measure. This has been a kind of a weird year to end the decade on, but something that I know I've heard a lot, and I think you guys will probably agree with, but this has been a great year for movies, and with great movies come great lists. Yes, because with lists, you can take the things that you like this year, and you can rank them, and put them in order, and kind of make it a contest, and rank art arbitrarily. And there's no way, like in a week or two, that my opinion, or my ranking of the films that I saw this year will change at all. There is no way. Not a chance. In 2019, I saw over 200 movies. Over half of them were new release films. And if you want to see my ranking of every single new release movie that I saw this year, you can click the link in the description. That'll take you to my letterbox profile where I rank every movie that I saw this year, new releases in order of preference. But before we get started, I wanted to give a couple shout outs to some movies that I did see this year that I did love, but they didn't quite make the top 20. No hard feelings, guys. Maybe just try to be better next year. In my number 25 spot, we have my Mike Flanagan's Dr. Sleep. In my number 24 spot, we have Olympic Dreams. Number 23, we have Sword of Trust. Number 22, The Irishman. Ooh, I'm sure I surprised some of you with that choice. And then closing out my honorable mentions is my number 21 spot with Netflix's I Lost My Body. Now, without further ado, I present to you my top 20 favorite films of 2019. With Midsommar, A24 has delivered on another unique movie-going experience with a film that is as challenging as it is disturbing. It features excellent performances, it's insanely well-crafted. Ari Aster surprised the hell out of me last year with Hereditary, my favorite movie of the year, so needless to say, whatever he was working on next, I was pretty excited to see, and I think with Midsommar, I don't really think he disappointed. Because with this film, he tells a story that is emotionally resonant and impactful, however, I do wish that it distanced itself from some of the themes and some of of the larger ideas that were at play in his prior film. One film that I saw during my time at the South by Southwest Film Festival that thoroughly impressed me was this movie, Them That Follow. This movie follows a young woman who is going through some things in her social life that will impact her largely religious family as well as the religious town that she resides in. I really loved this movie. I think it's so incredibly well made and it's a very honest look at religion and patriarchy. And going into this movie, I had no idea of the incredible cast that this film had. Walton Goggins, Olivia Coleman, Caitlin Dever, just to name a few of the really talented people in this movie. This is a really tense film that's beautifully shot. A lot of the characters in this movie have well-defined arcs throughout it. It's certainly one of the better made movies that I saw during my time at the festival, and I hope you guys have the opportunity to see this film. If there's any movie on this list that I would say, this surprised me the most, it's got to be Toy Story 4. This is a movie that I kind of resented for existing at all, but thankfully, Forky heals all wounds. Upon initially seeing this film, I think I said in my review that I could imagine this movie not existing. I don't think it's 100% necessary, but upon subsequent viewings and kind of letting this movie kind of gestate with me over the course of this year, I do think it actually is a really unique take on these characters, and it takes them in a really natural progression. And I can almost guarantee that if you're a fan of the Toy Story trilogy, and you grew up with these films, I think you almost have to love some of the things that this movie does with these characters. Because this is a film that not only deeply understands and cares about these characters, but I think it takes them in really mature and emotionally rich directions. And in a lot of ways, I'd say this movie is probably the most adult Pixar film, and it just so happens to be incredibly gorgeous. Yet another film that I saw during my time at South by Southwest, a film festival that kind of specializes in showing genre films. So I don't think it was really any surprise to me that one of my favorite films that I saw during my time there was the horror comedy Villains. A film following a couple who rob a gas station, their car then runs out of gas, and so they're forced to break into a home. Unfortunately for them, they chose the wrong home. This film has about everything you could want with a horror comedy. It's shocking, it's suspenseful, but it's also really, really funny. The two leads of this movie have terrific chemistry, and I was just thoroughly entertained throughout this entire runtime. This film, like many of the movies that I will mention in this list, are available on VOD, so if you didn't get a chance to see this in theaters, I think it's available there, and I think you guys will really like it if you enjoy genre movies.
Lulu Wang's The Farewell is certainly one of the most touching films that I saw this year that I had the pleasure of seeing this year, and it's only one of four A24 movies that I actually have on this list. This film follows a Chinese family who learns that their grandmother is ill, and upon learning this, they decide to go to China, and instead of informing her that she is deathly ill, they decide to plan a wedding instead so they can have the entire family there one last time. This film examines a lot of really interesting things, one of which is the cultural gap between China and America, and where in that gap we deal with things like grief and death. Aquafina is absolutely wonderful in this film, and I really, really do hope that this movie gets some award recognition around Oscar season. No, this list is not sponsored by the South by Southwest Film Festival. I just saw a lot of really great movies there, and one of which was the grand prize winning film at the festival with Alice. And for good reason. This movie follows a mother who, after losing everything, decides to take some pretty extreme measures in order to protect herself as well as her child. And in doing so, I think this film not only examines the systemic but social gender disparity between women and men, particularly in their roles of parents, and the kind of pressures that we put on mothers in order to provide. And it results in a film that's not only incredibly powerful, but really funny too, surprisingly. The actress that plays Alice, Emily Papinier, I believe, gives one of the best performances that I've seen this year, certainly the best that I saw during my time at the festival. Unfortunately, I don't think that this film is available to stream yet, so if you guys do happen to come across it, please do not hesitate to seek out this film. It's really moving and it's really well done. Sam Mendez's new war epic that actually only ends up being about nine miles long. I think what makes this film so effective in the way that it's shot, trying to look like it's all done in one take, is you are able to follow these soldiers in real time. When they go across the field or investigate an abandoned German bunker, you're with them every step of the way. And if you had the pleasure of seeing this movie in IMAX or in a Dolby cinema like I did, when stuff starts to get crazy, you really feel it. And with Roger Deakins being the director of photography of this movie, this is certainly one of the most gorgeous films that I had the pleasure of seeing this year. And for all you award enthusiasts out there, this is a movie that is absolutely going to get nominated for Best Picture. I would be blown away if it did not. A pretty late addition to my top 20, but A Portrait of a Lady on Fire is certainly one of the most stunning movies that I saw this year. This movie's filled with this brimming, lush cinematography, but it's also one of the most quietly emotional films that I saw in 2019. And no, not just because of the subject matter, but I think if you enjoyed Call Me By Your Name, I think you will also like this movie. I think the two are very similar in regards to their tone as well as their pacing. And me personally, I found this movie to be quite captivating and really hypnotic in a way. This film does have some rather slow pacing, which may be an issue for some of you watching this, but I found it to be quite engrossing. This is another film that I don't think it does it justice to like watch it on your laptop or on your phone. I think if you can, go out and see it in the theater or like at minimum watch it on your giant 4K TV. This is one of the most stunning films that I saw this year and I hope it receives a lot more love than just best foreign film. Just as expected, uh, the new John Wick movie? Yeah. It's totally badass. It delivers on the action. Keanu Reeves continues to blow me away. Halle Berry too is really great in this movie. And I think with the two of these actors, they're kind of the pinnacle of two people who are so dedicated to the craft of filmmaking and on delivering authentic visceral reactions from the audience. And John Wick Chapter 3 continues this series precedent by delivering on a film that not only has incredible action, but a really engrossing narrative as well. I could watch these movies until the sun explodes or until Keanu Reeves actually starts to age out of this role. I mean, whatever comes first. Well, uh, <laughs> damn guys, James Gray made one of the best sci-fi films of the decade and like 12 of you went to see it. From a technical level, Ad Astra is impeccable. The performances, cinematography, editing, music, special effects, all of which some of the best that I've seen this year. Also, side note, this is Brad Pitt's best performance of the year. And yes, I've seen the other one. 
Kicking off my top 10, we have Olivia Wilde's directorial debut with Booksmart, a completely delightful film from start to finish. We're experiencing a slight resurgence with studio comedies, and I think Booksmart is absolutely one of the better ones that we've seen recently. This film features two performances from Caitlin Dever and Beanie Feldstein, and I think both of their careers, because of this movie, are going to be launched into stardom. And the same can be said for Olivia Wilde, who really establishes a strong voice for herself with this movie. And Booksmart is not only completely completely hilarious, but it features a really touching message about being yourself and friendship. And considering that this film is a part of a genre that is most often kind of dominated by a male perspective, I think that this movie does a lot to cement itself well within this genre, the coming of age genre. I'm sure a lot of you watching this probably have never seen or have even heard of this movie, but this is a film that I saw during my time at South by Southwest, and it's the directorial debut of Karen Main. This is a comedy that follows a young Catholic girl who is beginning to discover her own sexuality at kind of the cusp of womanhood. One of my favorite things about this movie is it covers a topic that not only is taboo among film, but kind of societally as well. Again, just like Booksmart, this is a movie that takes an idea and a perspective that is often represented by young men in film, and it flips it to where we are given a more feminine look at something that kind of everybody experiences at one point. And in a lot of ways, this film is actually kind of semi-autobiographical for this movie's writer and director, Karen Main, who did such an excellent job. This movie is so funny. And again, I know a lot of you haven't seen this movie, but I'm pretty confident that this is getting a 2020 release. Karen Main, if you're watching this right now, you go down in the comments and kind of confirm that for us because I know I love this movie and I'm sure a lot of the people watching this would also love to see the incredible work that you put on display with this movie. Taking one look at the news, I think it's very clear that we live in a difficult and a complex time. And it's precisely because of that that I'm so happy that movies exist like The Great Dictator, like A Life is Beautiful, and now Jojo Rabbit. And it's exactly because of the time in which these movies were released that they're able to take that context and examine these ideas in a really funny and creative way. And that's exactly what Jojo Rabbit does. And what Taika Waititi is able to do is, like the films that came before this one, he's able to examine what is definitely like the most taboo topic of all time being the Holocaust. And he's able to examine this time period in a way that not only brings out the humanity of it, but some of the comedy as well. Knives Out, hands down, one of the most fun experiences that I had in the theater this year. It's surprising, it's hilarious, it's thrilling, and it's also kind of strangely poignant. And this film's cast is so killer. You have like a lot of really talented people in this movie. Chris Evans, Ana de Armas, Lakeith Stanfield, Jamie Lee Curtis, Daniel Craig, who gives like one of the most batshit performances that I've seen from him. And in addition to that, surprisingly, Ryan Johnson is able to weave some ideas throughout this film that are kind of like oddly topical. This is probably like one of the best crowd pleasers of the year, and this is a movie that I recommended to a lot of my family members as a film that you should go out and see if you are to go see a movie this holiday season. Going into this movie, the only thing I really knew about it was Jesse Eisenberg's in this film, and that's about it. The Art of Self-Defense is another movie that surprised the hell out of me. This movie is hysterical. It's also contrastly kind of shocking and pretty horrifying. But I think most importantly, it's a movie of substance, and it has something to say about masculinity and the societal definitions that we have of what exactly that means, as well as examining themes of violence and brutality. I don't really want to give anything away, and if you haven't seen the trailer for this movie, Movie, I would also stay away from that because I think out of all of the movies this year, this is one that I recommend to people kind of just going completely dry into. Go see this movie if you love dark comedies. I think you will really, really enjoy it. Kicking off my top five, we have what is most certainly the biggest and most well-known movie on this list with Avengers Endgame. Every year we have at least one major blockbuster on my list, and Endgame was the one that made the cut this year. I mean, this movie was so much fun. It was so satisfying as a fan, and it kind of made me feel things that I didn't expect to feel in a movie at this large of scale. And the fact that it's able to tie together 22 films of a saga and give it a finale in a way that not only paves the way 
way for some films to come, but also pays tribute to those that came before it. And it does so in a way that feels impactful and resonant. I was kind of blown away by that. This is a film that if you've been sticking with these movies since 2008 for 11 years, I think you will be completely satisfied by this movie. I don't really know how you couldn't be. Uncut Gems is my shit. This movie is nuts. This movie's completely white knuckled. It's like pure adrenaline straight into your eyeballs. And it does that, but it also manages to be pretty topical. Over the past 10 years or so, Adam Sandler hasn't really clicked with me. So I was so happy to see him make a movie that I was so madly in love with. And with his performance in this movie, if he doesn't get some love from the Academy this year, I think we can all kind of unanimously agree that the Oscars are complete bullshit, more so than we kind of already do. Similar to Snowpiercer, Bong Joon-ho tells a story of varying socioeconomic classes and what those look like when they begin to intersect. And instead of Snowpiercer, which takes this model and makes it linear going from left to right, you have what is going up and down. The people are literally under the affluent, rich, kind of top 1%. This is a film that I've almost seen on every single person's top 10 list of the year. And if it's not on that list, it's probably because you haven't seen it you know who you are. This is a film that works on almost every single level because it's thrilling, it's funny, and it is a acute examination on something that a lot of people around the world are experiencing with this large gap between what are the wealthy and what are the poor. And this is a film that hands down needs to win Best Picture. No, it's not my favorite movie of the year, but it absolutely is the best movie that I've seen this year. The Lighthouse is probably the most unique experience that I had in a movie theater this year. Robert Eggers employs some of the best things that you could really ever ask for when making a film. In watching The Lighthouse, it's an experience that is so multifaceted. The way Robert Eggers uses the cinematography of this film to tell a story, how he uses the black and white as well as the reduced aspect ratio, they all serve this film not only in regards to its tone, but the narrative as well, which results in a film that is like haunting, it's beautiful, and it's hypnotic and it's terrifying. It's a movie that blew me away almost at every single turn. And it's a film that I would love to see get some recognition from the Academy this year. But again, the Oscars are kind of bullshit. Well, we're here guys. We've reached the end of the list. 2019 was certainly a year that had its high highs and its low lows, but there is one movie that remained constant throughout all of it. It's a film that I saw in theaters and then months later I continued to think about it and it didn't leave my brain because of how much this movie impacted me. Similar to his work in the 2005 film, The Squid and the Whale, Noah Baumbach examines the family dynamics as a result of a divorce. From like the opening scene of this movie, Baumbach is able to fill you with the same kind of sadness and heartbreak that these two characters feel. We are immediately shown the best things that this marriage has to offer, and then subsequently are given a more honest look at this relationship. Because with Marriage Story, what Noah Baumbach is able to do is capture a more candid look at marriage in the way that he utilizes the character characters in the dialogue in this movie. And in watching this film, it's clear that Noah Baumbach has a firm understanding of these characters and where he wants to take them emotionally. Because in everything they say or don't say, you learn so much about these characters. I'm sure a lot of you have heard if you haven't seen this movie, but Adam Driver, Scarlett Johansson, two of the best performances that I've seen this year. And it's something that's so great that I've seen a lot of people kind of miss the point on, but this isn't a film that is showing one side to be correct and the other one it villainizes. This is a film that shows both sides equally and offers the merits as well as the detractions from both perspectives in this marriage. And towards the end of this film, there's such a clear recognition from one of these characters that they are understanding that what they did was wrong and they messed up. It's one of my favorite scenes of the year and I think it's a perfect representation of this character's arc in the journey that they go through on throughout this entire film. If you're someone who hasn't seen this movie and the only real experience that you've had with it is through social media, with a lot of the memes and the videos of this movie and honestly some of the kind of bad takes regarding this film i would encourage you to not let that deter you if you're looking for something that is this emotional gut punch of a film please seek out marriage story 
It's on Netflix. You could watch it right now. I think it'll really blow you guys away. Well, guys, that does it for another year here over at my channel. I want to thank you guys for watching this video and sticking with my channel for as long as some of you guys have. If you're a bit new to the channel, as I said at the beginning, you can click at the description in the bottom where you can go to my letterbox profile where you can follow me there and you can see my entire ranking of every single film that I saw that was a new release this year. And I just want to let you guys know who are sticking around to the end of this video, but there will be some new things that you guys will see on my channel this year. I'm going to take my YouTube channel in some pretty new and exciting directions, and I hope you guys are there with me, and I hope you guys like some of the new stuff that I have to offer. Of course, I'm still going to be here talking about movies, but it's not really going to be in the same way that you guys have experienced up to this point. So what were some of your favorite films that you saw in 2019? Leave your thoughts and opinions down below, and as always, guys, thank you so much for watching today. I hope you liked today's video, and if you did, you can click on the link down below, or you can subscribe to my channel to see more movie reviews and movie related things. Guys, thank you so much for watching and see you next time.